Pay close attention. What you're about to see is Bible prophecy being fulfilled. Welcome to another edition of YPN News, bringing you the news that relates to Bible prophecy and foretold by Yeshua Hawkins. Well, in the news today, we're going to talk a lot about the vaccines, the vaccinations, mm -hmm. and can the government force that upon individuals? Can the states, can employers say, tell their employees mm -hmm. that they have to get vaccinated? We'll have those details. Also, we'll talk about, uh, we have a message from the Ukrainian president pushing back at Russia for the recent drills that Russia did right on their border and that mm -hmm. tit for tat. And then lastly, we'll talk about the petrodollar. It's been the, uh, the main currency there and for years, but now some major superpowers, Russia, China, mm -hmm. are pushing back and saying, we're ready for a new currency. Right. So we'll have those details. But first, Joe Scarborough, co-host of MSNBC's Morning Joe, recently gave his personal opinion on immunizations for COVID-19 and how some are calling vaccine passports and the like taking on the mark of Satan. Well, Mr. Scarborough called those who fight wearing masks lunatics and those who don't want to get the vaccine but still be allowed to go to public events like baseball games, morons, reckless, and irresponsible. Mm. Mr. Car Scarborough told his colleagues, quote, if I want to go to a baseball game with my son who has a his history of upper respiratory issues, I don't want a bunch of idiots sitting anywhere near us in Fenway or in a little league park that haven't taken the vaccine. Well, he also added, now, if they don't want to take the vaccine and they want to die, that's their right as Americans. That's all right. They don't have to take the vaccine and they can die or they can get really sick. Well, Scarborough's comments could lead one to believe if you don't want to take the vaccine, you don't care about your fellow man or even your own family. Well, he also strongly urged government and private organizations to get some type of vaccine receipt in place so that those who have had their shots can move about freely and those who have not can be separated from the rest of the herd. Interesting. Well, the mark of Satan, that's what Republican Representative Marjorie Taylor Greene has referred to vaccine passports as being. While the White House is trying to stay low-key in the process, they still admit they have to be involved to some degree. But what is so bothersome to most people is feeling like their rights to participate in everyday public life are being threatened. Take a look at this video and decide for yourself. Is this something like Biden's mark of the beast? Because that is really disturbing. They want you to be required to have something called a COVID passport. And this, this would mandate your ability to be able to travel, your ability to be able to go to events, your ability to be able to buy and sell, and I asked the question earlier today, is this something like Biden's mark of the beast? Because that is really disturbing. If you're going to come into the football game or the baseball game or the concert, you need your vaccine passport because we're trying to do a good job to keep everyone safe. This is what the Biden administration is trying to talk to these private companies into doing. Well, let's analyze that. You see, it's still the same thing. It's still fascism or communism, whatever you want to call it, but it's in it's coming from private companies. So I have a term for that. I call it corporate communism. This is 
can hit all, all parts of society, and so naturally um, the government um, is involved. But unlike other parts of the world, um, the government here is not viewing its role as the place to create a passport, uh, nor a place to hold the data uh, of, of citizens. Uh, we view this as something that the private sector um, is doing and will do. We view this as something that the private sector um, is doing and will do. We view this as something that the private sector um, is doing and will do. What's important to us, and we're leading an interagency process right now to go through um, the, these uh, details, uh, are that some important criteria be met. is to help ensure that any solutions in this area should be simple, free, open source, accessible to people, both digitally and on paper, and designed from the start to protect people's privacy. Representative Green's comments quite a bit different than uh, Joe Scarborough's there, and you see both sides of the story. That's right. Well, just how serious is the United States government about mandating vaccinations for coronavirus? Our next video explains what has taken place in the past and recent history with virus threats and immunization requirements. There are some problems with the current vaccines that make it difficult to mandate everyone get the shots. Please listen carefully. Record numbers of Americans are getting vaccinated against the coronavirus. The U.S., the most vaccinated large nation in the world. Dozens of countries are now working to vaccinate their populations in an effort to end the global pandemic. President Biden says that by the end of his first 100 days, the United States is aiming to have administered 200 million doses. And by May 2021, every American adult who wants one will be eligible to get in line for a shot. That said, 30 percent of U.S. adults still don't want to get the COVID vaccine, but they may not have much of a choice. The federal government can can require vaccination and things like that for coming in and out of the country. Both the state and city can have vaccine law. Both the state and city can have vaccine laws based on um, their legislative authority. Requiring a vaccine is a health and safety work rule, and employers can do that. Bonnie Jacobson knows this all too well. The Brooklyn resident was recently let go from her job after refusing to get inoculated. I was sitting at home and I all of a sudden just opened an email. I'm sitting on my couch and it said, basically, while we respect your decision at this time, your employment has been terminated. So can you actually be forced to take the COVID vaccine against your will in the United States? To be clear, the White House's chief medical advisor has already said that he doesn't think the federal government will ever make the COVID vaccine mandatory. However, powers at the city and state level, not to mention the legal rights granted to employers under U.S. labor law, may make it pretty difficult for some Americans to evade inoculation against the coronavirus. This isn't as unprecedented as you might think. There are a lot of required inoculations which are easy to take for granted. Just take the chicken pox. All 50 states and the District of Columbia have laws requiring children entering childcare or public schools to have some sort of provable protection against the disease, whether that's a vaccine or evidence of immunity. In fact, schools from preschool through university typically require a battery of inoculations before you can step foot on campus. When I was a health commissioner in Washington, D.C., we had uh, passed laws that required anyone who went to a um, school to um, be vaccinated against certain you know, preventable diseases. There are religious, medical, and philosophical exemptions that vary state by state. But for around 170 years, America's schools have done a pretty thorough job controlling vaccine-preventable disease in the U.S. The very first school vaccination mandate was in Massachusetts back in the 1850s. It was to protect against smallpox transmission. By the start of the 20th century, almost half of all states required students to be vaccinated before matriculating. In the early 1970s, schools with a measles vaccine mandate had incidence rates that were up to 51% lower than states without the laws. And from there, school vaccine mandates expanded over the next few decades. 
But while schools had been requiring vaccines since the mid-19th century, states didn't explicitly have that same power to roll out universal inoculation rules for all residents for another 50 years. In 1905, the Supreme Court case of Jacobson versus Massachusetts set the legal precedent, which now allows states to require vaccines. The Supreme Court said, yes, you can limit individual rights to protect the public health. And one way you can do it in that case is require vaccination. We've seen states exercise this authority to varying degrees in the years since. Take, for example, the 2019 measles outbreak in New York. New York imposed the mandate. It's imposed an MMR mandate, but it limited it to the neighborhoods where the measles cases were high. And it was accompanied by a $1,000 fine for those who did not have MMR. Legal experts say that narrowing the vaccine mandate to particular zip codes made it easier to justify in court rather than a statewide mandate. But critics warn that these types of targeted requirements may lead to discriminatory practices. In general, these things are done at the state level, but big cities, for example, also have vaccine laws. When I was the city health commissioner in Washington, D.C., although that certainly functions as a state, uh, we also had vaccine laws in, the, in Washington, D.C. So far, no cities or states have made the COVID vaccine mandatory, though some places have started the conversation. In November 2020, the New York State Bar Association recommended making the shot mandatory for all residents except those with a medical exemption. And then, of course, there's the biggest rulemaker of them all, the federal government, which in this case actually has pretty limited powers expressly spelled out in the Constitution. There isn't in the Constitution, the power to protect the public health. Well, the federal government doesn't mandate vaccines. Um, what they do is they make recommendations. There are, however, softer powers at the federal level that have been used before to incentivize mass inoculation. There are, however, softer powers at the federal level that have been used before to incentivize mass inoculation. The federal government has acted in the public health in the past using other parts, such as its commerce parts. So it could, for example, mandate vaccines before you travel in the interstate channels or before you engage in interstate commerce. If you're a truck driver that drives across state, maybe the federal government can mandate that you'll be vaccinated. The power of the purse is another key tool in Washington's arsenal. It can pass a law saying states will give you $3 million if you mandate the vaccine, but that's up to a limit. It can't do it to the degree that's coercive. The federal government could also, theoretically, impose it as a condition of getting a passport. So states and cities can require vaccines, and the federal government has a lot of influence as well. But the big question is whether the government will actually go through with rolling out a universal mandate. The first challenge is we won't have enough vaccine doses for people who want them. You can't require vaccines that's not available, that people can't get. Another major factor to consider, none of the three COVID vaccines in circulation here in the U.S. are fully licensed by the FDA. Instead, they are all cleared under something known as an emergency use authorization or an EUA. Until they are officially approved, mandates seem to be off the table. And then there's the even bigger question of enforcement. Mandates to some degree depend on pretty widespread compliance. You can't enforce a mandate if 40 percent of your population is fighting back. If the problem is widespread mistrust, mandate won't fix it. You need communication, you need education, you need to earn the people's trust by, sh by transparently showing them that the vaccine is safe and effective, by explaining to them the process of approving it and so forth. And keep in mind, if any city or state did implement a mandate, the kinds of repercussions we're talking about are relatively tame. No one is floating the idea of jail time or coming to your house and holding you down while they administer a shot. Refusal would probably just mean a fine or maybe some sort of other tax or penalty. Experts say it may also mean you are barred from entry to concerts or can't book a seat on certain airlines. In Israel, for example, they use the green passport to allow access to businesses like hotels and restaurants to those who have been vaccinated against the virus or have already had COVID-19. Implementation, though, might be tough here in the U.S. So how will this actually play? out. Experts tell me the most likely scenario is a repeat of what we've seen in the past. Let's say the city where you live decides against requiring the COVID vaccine. Does that mean you're free from mandatory COVID inoculation? Not necessarily. Your employer may not be willing to take no for an answer. While this is in part a PR tactic, it's also totally within an employer's rights to roll out this kind of requirement. Legal experts say private businesses have pretty extensive rights. Requiring a vaccine is a health and safety work rule. Employers, like some hospitals, already require employees to get the annual influenza vaccine. So there's precedent that under the law, an employer can force an employee to get vaccinated, and if they don't, fire them.
Well, a lot of interesting uh, comparisons and variables there in regards to the, van the, the vaccine and whether it should be a mand mandatory requirement or not. But at the end of the day, this, the decision still comes down to the individual and what they desire to do. That's right. Well, the country has reached a new milestone of 100 million doses of COVID-19 vaccine administered. Uh, in recognition of the progress the country is making, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention has issued new travel guidelines for those who have completed their COVID shots. Uh, fully vaccinated grandparents can fly to their healthy grandkids without getting a COVID-19 test or self-quarantine, provided they follow the other recommended travel measures while traveling. Uh, this was said by Dr. Rochelle Walensky, who is the director of the CDC. Well, now these people who have had their shots are considered low risk, but still have to take precautions, including wearing masks, avoiding crowds, and continuing to social distance. While this might be hopeful to some, the CDC is still encouraging everyone to avoid non-essential travel, especially for those who have not been vaccinated. While this all might seem to be positive, COVID hospital admissions have risen in 23 states and deaths are continuing to climb in 11 states. President Joe Biden is urging Americans not to let their guard down and take getting vaccinated seriously, saying, quote, we're not even halfway done yet. Too many Americans are acting as if the fight is over. It's not, end quote. Well, with the vaccine campaign going strong, the American people are definitely trying to get their lives back to some sense of normal. Now, the federal government is promising help for economic recovery. Already, the country has added 916,000 new jobs in March. The largest gains for employment were found in leisure and hospitality, uh, as well as strong gains in food service and construction. The CDC has more recommendations as the head, U.S. heads uh, into the latest holiday weekend of Easter. They are recommending unvaccinated people gather only with members of their own household or outdoors six feet apart. But anyone who is fully vaccinated can have indoor gatherings and does not need to wear a mask, which sounds a bit different from Dr. Walensky's earlier cautions to or for travel of those who have been fully vaccinated. Well, another snag for the Johnson & Johnson vaccine, reportedly all future shipments are being put on hold. The reason? A mix-up in the production of the vaccine has ruined millions of doses. Now, this is an untimely setback as the country sees another spike in COVID cases. Well, this could be the fourth wave that we had mentioned in recent broadcasts now overtaking the country. According to the latest data from CDC, Michigan and several northeastern states are showing the highest numbers of cases per capita. This includes Rhode Island, where Dr. Megan Rainey works as an ER physician. In an interview with CBS Evening News, Dr. Rainey explains the difficulty of being a doctor with COVID, saying, I have never been through a year as difficult as this one. Well, she also says she is seeing lots of younger to middle-aged patients, patients, which she hasn't seen until now. Now, Dr. Rainey, Rainey believes this is due in part because they haven't gotten vaccinated and because they are intermingling in society as normal. Well, as America gets closer to, or as they have reached that 100 million uh, vaccine milestone, uh, that is at least getting one dose, uh, over half the country, as we mentioned earlier, are seeing an increase in COVID cases. And of course, we're seeing a spread, a continual spread of the new variants. While people are planning to travel for the upcoming Easter holiday, the continued spread of COVID-19 is looming in the air and has been up in the last Two weeks. Officials are concerned that gatherings could lead to the spread of more COVID infections. In fact, one church in Massachusetts canceled its Easter services after staff members there tested positive for COVID. Well, hospital admissions climbed in 20 states as hospitalizations averaged 5,000 per day in the United States. Now, while cases climb, Michigan has seen its first confirmed case of the Brazilian variant as cases of the UK variant continue to spread. Dr. Matthew Sims, the Director of Infectious Disease Research at Beaumont Health said, 30 to 50 year olds in particular who have not, for the most part, been able to get vaccinated yet 
are more at risk and we're seeing them in the hospital. Uh, Beaumont Health has seen its cases uh, over, the, over the recent weeks quadruple. Wow. Dr. Anthony Fauci said that the results of pulling back too soon uh, regarding the COVID restrictions are being manifested in Michigan. The Brazilian variant has so far been detected in at least 23 states. And uh, Samuel Scarpina, an assistant professor for the Network Science Institute of Northeast University, said one of the concerns is that some of the vaccine-derived immunity might be less effective against these P1 variants, although that is still an open question. Well, as many Americans prepare to celebrate Easter, Father Tim Pelk of St. Ambrose Catholic Church near Detroit contrived a unique way to sprinkle holy water on people's Easter baskets while maintaining social distancing. Even though he had some opposition amongst members of the clergy, uh, say that the way he went about sprinkling the holy water on the Easter eggs he went ahead with his plan to use a water gun filled with the holy water to shoot it on the eggs as people drove by in their vehicles. Mm, I wonder if that was something that people could actually have done without, you know, considering how many churches have actually canceled a lot of these different things, but seems like he was determined to get that done. Well, in a reservoir near Tampa, Florida, residents are in fear as the reservoir holding millions of gallons of radioactive water, which has sprung a leak, could collapse, causing a catastrophic disaster. Um, Jake Saar, the Manatee County Public Safety Director, in a press conference about the situation, explained that the containment wall near the leak shifted laterally, signifying structural collapse could occur anytime. Local officials are evacuating homes and closing roads in the county and telling residents to get out now. Well, the leak was found over a week ago in one of the walls of the 77-acre reservoir, which contains waste left over from the production of fertilizer. Now, even though crews are work working frantically to remove the water from the reservoir, experts say that the contaminated water is going to enter the waterways one way or another, which could result in algae bloom, aquatic life die off, along with many other detrimental effects to the ecosystem. Well, the Ukrainian president, Vladimir Zelensky, has accused Russia of intimidation and is now calling for a new truce with pro-Moscow separatists. Zelensky said in a tweet, Muscle flexing in the form of military exercises on the border with Ukraine is an attempt to put pressure in the negotiations on ceasefire and peace as our value. We are ready always for provocations. Well, over the past week, Ukraine has reported Russian troop movements in Crimea, the peninsula annexed by Russia in 2014, and along the country's shared border. Now, even though a truce uh, that was brokered in 2020, the conflict uh, east, which is in the East Donbass region, reignited in January with 20 Ukrainian soldiers where, where, the, where 20 Ukrainian soldiers were killed. Right. Now, Sergei Lavrov said of the conflict, the majority of the Ukrainian military understands any actions leading to a tense conflict can prove fatal. And just like we've uh, reported many times in the past, when these countries do these drills, they always talk about the provocations and we're ready for it, you know, if it's going to go that way. So they're all making their plans for war. Yeah, that, that's no different than somebody, you know, creating some type of a fight scenario in your front yard. Yeah, you know, you're going to get the, the homeowner agitated, just like mm -hmm. you'll get these, you know, the leaders of these countries agitated when they see you doing these military drills. It really is kind of a taunt to say, hey, look, that's right. if you want to fight, we're ready to do it. Well, the United States has vowed uh, not to leave Ukraine on its own in the event of an es any escalating Russian aggression. Ned Price, the State Department spokesperson, said, we're absolutely concerned about Russian aggression and pro provocative actions in eastern Ukraine. Russia's destabilizing actions undermine the intentions achieved through the OSCE brokered agreement of July of last year. Well, according to the UN, conflict in the region has claimed more than 13,000 lives since 2014. And even though dozens of ceasefires have been put in place, the fighting has not yet stopped. Hmm. Well, lastly, we want to take 
want you to take a look at a uh, video on the U.S. dollar, as we mentioned at the beginning of the broadcast, and uh, how it was primarily the dominant form of global currency. But uh, its future is kind of looking a little bit bleak now as smaller players start to take it up a notch to separate themselves from the petrodollar. Take a look at this video. Is the U.S. dollar replaceable? For decades, the U.S. greenback has essentially been the de facto global currency. From foreign bank reserves to the pricing of gold and oil, the U.S. dollar reigns supreme. But that dominance is now being challenged. Can the U.S. dollar remain the global reserve currency? Absolutely not. So there's a very, very strong motivation for a lot of countries to move away from the dollar. The U.S. dollar is in danger of losing its status as the world's reserve currency. So how likely is a capital war between China and the U.S.? The U.S. dollar's supremacy can be traced back to the Bretton Woods Agreement. Created after the Second World War, many countries began pegging their currencies to the dollar, which was pegged to gold. But even after the U.S. left the gold standard in the 1970s, its currency remained dominant. Because during that decade, OPEC also agreed to price their oil in U.S. dollars. Today, almost every global transaction is done using America's money. The U.S. used its control of the dollar to increase surveillance of global money flows and curb financing toward bad actors. It did this by imposing sanctions on its rivals. Under the system, if a business or country tries to trade with a sanctioned entity in dollars, the U.S. has the power to cut off its access to U.S. currency. But now, other countries are challenging the dollar. In March 2009, China and Russia called for a new global currency. One that, according to the former governor of the People's Bank of China, is disconnected from individual nations and is able to remain stable in the long run. China's concerns center on the trillions of US dollars it holds as reserves and the possibility that they would lose value with inflation. That's why they called on the IMF to develop a currency that would be an alternative to the dollar. That didn't happen, but in 2016, China's yuan became another one of the world's reserve currencies. By 2020, central banks across the world were holding $221 billion worth of yuan. That's a small portion compared to the 6.8 trillion held in US dollars. Many analysts argue that China is working towards displacing the greenback, and it's taking steps like this to make that happen. You've heard of petrodollars, but what about petroyuan? The US dollar has been the main currency for oil futures contracts, so launching a contract in its domestic currency is a sign that China wants the yuan to play a bigger role in global oil trading. As we saw in the video there, some are saying that absolutely the petrodollar is not going to be that main currency. Mm -hmm. And, of course, the United States, they've said in the past that they will not allow this to take place. Right. Um, but you have Russia and China, and as we talked about, they're, they're very strong nations. And now they're looking for those ways to get around the U.S. greenback, um, especially when the United States continues to put these sanctions um, on countries like Iran and withholds them getting their money to, to use, which continues to hurt their economy and of course you know then that leads to a whole bunch of other problems so um, it'll be interesting to see how far the United States takes this um, you know this uh, I wouldn't say a threat but the steps that these other countries are taking to bypass that petrodollar that's right and as we've mentioned before a reporter before regarding the you know other things that the United States sees as a, a grass towards uh, money being taken out of its coffers with the you know, the pipeline, Nord Stream mm -hmm. 2 pipeline as another thing between Russia and Germany or Europe. Um, and the, the other dollars, I know we talked about a little bit, the BRICS um, currency between Brazil and Russia and, and India and China and South America, you know, that kind of went hush hush. But, I, you know, those nations are still trying to work their way around the U.S. because a lot of them are affected by, like you mentioned, those sanctions when they can't do business with other countries as a result. 
right? And they're getting to the point where they're tired of it and they're ready collectively, they're ready to uh, make a change. And that's probably what it's gonna take, you know, collectively, they're going to come against the United States. That's right. Well, if you'd like to learn more about these stories, contact the House of Yahweh when you do. Don't forget to request your free copy of the Prophetic Word magazine and monthly newsletter. Here's how. To contact the House of Yahweh, you can write them at The House of Yahweh, P.O. Box 2498, Abilene, Texas, 79604. You can call them at 1-800-613-9494. Visit them on any of their websites by going to Yahweh.com, YeshraHawkins.com, or Yahweh'sBranch.com. You can visit our website by going to ypnnews.com. If you would like to email the House of Yahweh, you can do so by emailing info at yahweh.com. For any international calls, you can call the number that's on your screen now. And uh, lastly, don't forget to check out the Israel Says program and the Ask Israel program by going to yisraelsays.com and askyisrael.com. Guaranteed to find the answers to any scriptural questions you have. Pages of pages of information uh, will come up if you do a search, a word search, a uh, phrase search, and so forth. You'll find all your answers that you're looking for in those two programs. Well, as the world is preparing for uh, more sickness and war, which is looming on, her, on the horizon, well, Yisrael Hawkins is bringing a message of both peace and health. Well, don't go anywhere because up next is Israel Hawkins with that message. For all of us here at YPN News, I'm Katan Alexander. And I'm Jeffrey Heimerman. Thank you for watching. Yeah.